Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the M365 Voice. My name is Sarah Hazi. And I am Mike Madani. And I'm Antonio Mayo. And thank goodness we don't do outtakes on this show. Thank goodness. Are we ready? Do we think we can do this? I think we can do this now. We've tried to work all of the <clears throat> one-liners and singers out of our system. Um, we are pulling another random question uh, out of the cup today. Are you both ready? Mm -hmm. Okay, here we go. Um, oh, this is a really good one. How do I choose whether to use a Power App form, a Microsoft form, or a Microsoft list? Hmm. That's actually a really good topic. Um, I'm going to be very interesting, interested to hear what everybody thinks about that. So how do I choose when to use or build a Power App, a Microsoft form, or a Microsoft list? OK. So my usual standard approach to that question, because we get that question often as we build out apps and forms and stuff for clients, and my uh, typical approach is to choose the simplest option that meets the requirements, but also build something that's maintainable. And the, the maintainability of it usually drives me to the simplest solution. So if I can get away with doing it with a Microsoft Forms form or a list form, often we will because I find Power Apps are great, but uh, you know it's certainly a, a bigger lift to, to make one happen and often requires a more technical skill set to maintain them. Yes, similar approach I take um, with uh, my, my first preference is, is a Microsoft list because the integration it has with other, like at least for with, with Active Directory and with other things that you can do within, within SharePoint. Uh, or the whole M365 stack uh, versus forms is like this piece that lives within M365. Other than that, what you can pull from it from a flow perspective, there's not this doesn't have that smartness, that much smartness into yeah. it. Uh, but I definitely use Microsoft Forms in an environment where you don't have to sign into M365, so you can take enable that form to be anonymous. So that is that is a huge advantage there if you don't need the users to authenticate with M365. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, I really like uh, the way that you said that, Antonio, and I won't say it as well, but kind of the simplest option that meets the requirements because it all comes down to it depends right, on what you need. If you're building a really simple submission form um, that any anonymous user you want to submit, um, for example, um, when I when I do presentations, I have on my thank you slide, I have usually a QR code that people can scan. When they scan it, it will take them to a Microsoft form where they can submit their information to me and it'll automatically, with a Power Automate flow, send them my uh, a link to our podcast, a link to my LinkedIn, a link to my blog, and here's how to connect with me after the event. But that's kind of a one way with a simple workflow a straight up submission form anonymous user. But for something more robust or where you need to track the data, you need to do something with it, I wouldn't use a form for that unless it's a very simple tracking purpose. Um, or you're going to take the form data and put it into a SharePoint list. A Microsoft list is really nice for more transactional types of things or where you need to track who submitted it. And that's going to be part of your thing. But you don't need the weight of learning Power Apps to be able to build something really custom. Other cases where we've used Microsoft Forms is when we are running um, a proof of concept with customers. So let's say we set up a particular solution or feature in Microsoft 365, and we're going to run a proof of concept for four weeks. And and our proof of concept should usually really high touch. We spend a lot of time with the customers, making sure that they they understand what they're testing. They've got guidance <laughs> on how to test. We're available to help them. And at the end of each week, we usually have a survey, and it's usually a short survey. And we'll usually use the Microsoft Forms for that survey because it's the quickest way for the person to get to the thing they need to fill out. And it's really, I'll say, low friction for them to get to it, fill it out, and get us the info. Right? It's not sensitive info. Um, we are only making it available to people that are 
within the organization and only uh, you know people we send a link to. Um, so we're not too worried about the data that's being submitted. We're also not too worried about having to um, uh, uh, you know retain that data or do anything from a compliance perspective with that data. So mm -hmm. we'll usually use a Microsoft form in that case because it's the easiest thing for anyone on our team who doesn't know Power Apps to go and set up a Microsoft Forms form. And I feel like I want to take out the billboard advertisement to Microsoft again because we've talked about this many times on our podcast. Please, 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 if you want more enterprise organizations to adopt forms, please uh, put in security and compliance controls. So anybody from Microsoft who's listening, um, it's Azure Blob Storage on the back end of Microsoft Forms. You can't query it from a tenant perspective. You can't auto expire the form submission data. Right. You don't know if it's PCI data or if it's got personal information in it. There's nothing. It's a black DLP box. DLP won't read it. Yeah. Right. So um, I always like to put that advertisement in just in case Microsoft is listening so that they can please add that to the roadmap. Yeah, yeah and I echo that as well. Um, Another point to, to your point, Sarah, is the portability of Microsoft Forms. I cannot take a form and put it somewhere else. I cannot export and import a form. Yeah, I can export the results, but that's pretty much it. What if I want to kind of replicate something, same survey <laughs> with different flavor, and it's a survey is very long, or an intake form that is very long. I don't want to redo it over and over again. I cannot just, I cannot import something, anything. Okay. Um, so that's, that's painful. Well, you, it's a great point, actually, because you do get organizations that um, over time, they develop large numbers of survey forms or survey forms that are meant more than just what's your opinion. It's actually, you know, pulling real data. And when you do get a large number of those forms and let's say you get a, um, a tenant migration that needs to happen, right? It's impossible to pull those out and migrate them somewhere else. You literally have to rebuild them from scratch. So, yeah. yeah, I think factoring those decisions in um, when you choose a form solution is is probably pretty important in large organizations. So, you know, are you going to be storing any compliance related data? Right. Um, do any of the security and compliance controls need to be applied to it? Do the forms need to be portable somewhere else? So I need to migrate them ever. Is there a chance I'm going to? And if if any of those things are true, then that might rule out Microsoft Forms. Exactly. I think so. So we've covered kind of forms in examples of how we use it, either for simple survey data, a lot for simple survey data. We use it for our podcast. So anybody yep. who wants to submit a question to us can fill out a Microsoft form and, and we take that in. But again, that's survey data. Can you give an example of the types of things that you use lists for and then the types of things that you use Power Apps for? Because maybe if all three of us can provide some examples, that might help the listeners to kind of have a frame of reference for how we would use, make the choice. Yeah. Um, for list, I, I use Microsoft List a lot for project tracking, actually, rather than uh, planner. Uh, so we have a task list. Uh, Microsoft List is is the go-to for me to, to, to use it to track statuses of the project uh, or to track information about a migration. Uh, usually I build a master list of when when we when I'm doing any migration and take that list of for example SharePoint sites and feed it into a Microsoft list so that way everyone can get to it and flag what's to get migrated or not because I can take that list out and use it as my master list for migration. So ma mainly um, these kind of scenarios where you're not adding the extra power app on top of it, just a simple list, and it has quite a bit of color codes in, in place and uh, uh, doing some, some formatting, which looks nicer and you can visually track where things are, uh, makes it much easier than using a power app to track this kind of information. I like it. One of my key words for a Microsoft list is, if you're going to name something, and use the word tracker in the name, like an issue tracker, a migration tracker, oftentimes to me, that's a list. So I use it for test tracking. So if I have, if I'm testing something in UAT and I have quite a few testers, I'm gonna have those submit their test cases and their testing results in a Microsoft list. It's easy to track that kind of information. Uh, one example similar to that, but it's also, I think, a form of tracker based on how you just defined it, Sarah. Um, for a customer, we've built uh, a list, which is a policy register. 
So they have a number of policies across different policies. These policies are policy documents across different business units with the, across the organization. And those policies go through annual review and update, and there are a number of people that need to sign off on them, and they kind of go through a business process. So we track that across all the policies in a Microsoft list that has, you know, metadata columns for the various um, attributes we need to track, and we've used list formatting and so on to make it look appealing and make certain things stand out. So that's that's an area where we we have used a list form to enter in um, the uh, you know the the next update on a particular policy, and and it creates a nice a nice tracker, if you will. Yeah, um, yeah. Again, it is similar. It, it is a tracker. I built one for a client for procurement actually, when they they monitor when a software is being a license has been expired or a contract needs to be renewed. Uh, so that is a, a reminder, like ninety days and sixty and thirty days beforehand, and to go and track that kind of information, and it's very popular. Yeah. Yes. So what kinds of, do we have some examples? Um, I have a couple of examples for a Power Apps form, which is much more robust. I mean, you can build simple Power Apps forms, but I think of Power Apps forms as being much more robust. You need um, custom branding where you can control everything about the look and feel, or you need to engage in some pretty sophisticated if then and processing power within the form itself. Um, so I'm thinking about even things where you may need to gather evidence as part of the form. Maybe you need it for an audit process or an attestation process, which we've talked about before. To me, that would be a natural thing that you would want to use something with the sophistication of Power Apps to be able to have paginated forms, forms that are completely custom branded or have a lot more uh, rich capability in terms of what they can do and gather. Where we've used Power Apps before with some customers is where you have like a a work order type of scenario for field service people, where you've got work orders that get issued to field service people and they receive them on their phones and they need to capture evidence like like what you said, Sarah. So like photos of a thing they're about to repair or, you know, work order data comes in and then they, they need to fill in what they did and submit back that they completed the work. So that's that's one issue. And we've seen that used in like electrical utilities where um, they have, you know, repair folks that go out and repair electrical lines or um, power generating stations or equipment of that nature. Um, so really important type of work in that case. Um, so that's one one situation. Um, another is uh, uh, I'm trying to remember how we, we worded this. Uh, well, we've actually seen it used for. Uh, power apps for uh, forms where you're collecting information that that is need to be stored from a compliance perspective. So, for example, when we in our consulting organization have deals of of that are over a certain size, or of a certain complex or risky nature, we have to go before the deal review board, which is a group of executives where we have to go and explain our project and and defend why we should go ahead and do this project. And we do have a power app that we have to fill out with information, and it's quite an extensive form um, that gets submitted to them, uh, and it's it's stored and retained uh, with like risk mitigation measures for the project that are discussed in those calls. So that's another another example. Yeah, I've, I've, see, I've done a few, uh, one of them similar to what you said, Sarah, from a, from a branding perspective, just the client really wants it in a specific way, especially when it comes to the very long form uh, let's say the data source is a Microsoft list, but they want they want to break it up into like a wizard type of thing. So you just break up the screens, multiple screens, so that's easier to fill it out. Uh, another example when they want it a little bit more advanced in terms of relational metadata. So you select a parent metadata or whatever from a list and updates the actual second set of metadata kind of thing. Uh, something that you really can't do in a Microsoft list. So uh, when it comes to a little bit more advanced coding, if you want to call it, even though we say low code kind of power app, but if you want to get into the heavy lifting of forms type of scenarios, Microsoft uh, Power Apps was the, the choice for that. Yep. You made me think of an interesting scenario as well. And I was on Twitter tweeting a friend of ours about this uh, just last week. Um, when you are collecting um, large amounts of data, 
or data that represent that is relational, right? We have to keep in mind that SharePoint lists are not databases. They're not meant to be databases. So in those cases where you're creating a lot, of, you're collecting a lot of data, it's relational, it needs to be stored for long periods of time, and you're going to amass a large amount of data, then we'll typically go with Dataverse as the, mm -hmm. the data repository. And that will necessitate a Power App on top of it, right? Um, so I try not to use SharePoint lists for right. the data storage in enterprise scenarios because it's really easy to get a lot of data. Right. Um, so that'll drive us to a Power App usually. Agreed. If you need that uh, Dataverse or the Azure table storage, uh, you're pretty much looking at a Power App, and that could either be by uh, you need the full database capability or just by volume. Um, it isn't practical, and oftentimes we'll build a simple list or a SharePoint list, Microsoft list, and then you quickly outgrow it or you have to purge your data um, exactly. on a regular basis and can't have the audit data just because you're maximizing well beyond what it can store and retrieve for reporting needs. So, yeah, exactly. Wow, I, I feel like we covered that pretty quickly and pretty well. Um, how to choose from a Power App versus a Microsoft list versus a Microsoft form. Final thoughts on this question? I would say consider the decision carefully before you start building, right? Because it's really easy to get far down the path of building such forms and then realize, oh, I didn't think of this particular aspect of it and you have to start over. So uh, as part of the design phase of a form, and it might, you might think it's a simple form, but think about some of the questions like, um, you know, what kind of a data, data am I going to store? How long do I need to store the data? Is there any sensitivities around the data? Um, is it large volumes of data? Mm -hmm. And use the answers to those to help you figure out which which solution to use. I really I like, like that. And maybe um, don't go with just your personal preference choice, yeah. um, because I think sometimes when we figure out how to do something new, um, uh, sometimes then everything looks like I have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. It, it doesn't mean that we have to use the same solution all the time. So consider right. the context um, around what you need and what fits your requirements. That's a great point. Love it. All right, perfect. Well, thank you so much for listening and we'll catch you on the next episode. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.